Hello and welcome to ABC News Sunday. I'm Tamara O'Dyne. It's being hailed as an historic agreement and a turning point for the world. After two weeks of negotiations, nearly 200 countries committed to a new deal that aims to slow global warming. Temperatures had been projected to rise an estimated 2.7 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Scientists say anything over two degrees would have a significant impact on the planet. Now, this treaty aspires to limit any increase to 1.5 degrees. It's the first time so many nations have signed on to a binding agreement on climate change. And Europe correspondent Lisa Miller was there and she joins us now live from Paris. Lisa, given the significance of this deal, what's the mood like there? Well, Tamara, it's actually exactly a month today since those terrible terrorist attacks here in Paris and the security around landmarks like this is much less obvious than what we've seen over the last few weeks. But those attacks really played into this conference. In fact, some people thought that it might have helped create greater solidarity. And Francois Hollande, in those last few hours, uh, the conference actually referred to the attacks and said, let's make December the 12th the date that everyone remembers as when Paris helped the world turn. And Lisa, the deal nearly fell apart at the 11th hour. What happened with that? It was quite incredible. We saw the tension in the room. We knew something was going on. There was a delay. We found out later it was just one word. Shall had been inserted instead of should. And that caused enormous legal possibilities that were going to possibly derail it. They didn't want to reopen debate because they thought that there could be so many revisions. Phone calls were made between leaders and uh, one negotiator told me it was a crisis. But in the end, it all came together. A history-making moment. Almost 200 countries facing the test of their time. De Paris. The Paris Climate Agreement is accepted. Words many thought they'd never hear, sparking an outpouring of emotion, the clearest signal of just how much was riding on this. For the first time, the global community is signing up to a common environmental goal to reduce the warming of the planet, keeping sea levels from rising and caring for those unable to avoid the impact of climate change. Even though our work here is done, now the hard work of implementation begins. The Foreign Minister says no country will see it as perfect and it doesn't include everything Australia wants. While we didn't get all that we envisaged, we are certainly pleased with this agreement because it means all nations are committed to taking action and that's what we sought. There were a few dissenting voices, but their concerns were drowned out by the support of the big polluters whose actions can have the biggest impact, China, India and the US. This agreement sends a powerful signal that the world is firmly committed to a low carbon future. Paris Agreement will fulfil the wishes of Mahatma Gandhi, who used to say, we should care for a world we will not see. Wealthy and poor nations have been at odds for years over who should carry the financial burden of climate change. This deal will track the progress of developing nations and force all countries to constantly increase their emission reduction targets. Aujourd'hui, this is the most beautiful and most peaceful revolution that's ever been accomplished. In the centre of Paris, protesters carried a symbolic red line, calling on delegates to be as ambitious as possible. They'd been disappointed before. This landmark global accord has had a torturous path from the failures of Copenhagen in 2009. Even this agreement came a day past deadline and with a last minute plea from the French president as the morning session opened. It is rare to have the opportunity in a lifetime to change the world. You have it. You have this opportunity to change the world. Seize it so that the planet can live on. The reaction has been overwhelmingly positive, with environmental groups confident it signals the end of the fossil fuel era. And while they praise the lofty ambitions, ensuring countries follow through will still be a challenge. The hard work begins now. 
Julie Bishop says the deal allows Australia to do more. We know what our major trading partners are doing, the major economies are doing, uh, our major trading competitors are doing. Businesses looking at their bottom line could end up being the ones that now drive the move to a carbon neutral economy. Lisa Miller reporting from Paris. Well, back home, the pact has been hailed as a turning point and just the beginning of the hard work by Australia to shift to a zero carbon economy. It's put the federal government under renewed pressure to announce deeper emissions reductions targets and phase out fossil fuels. From Canberra, Susan McDonald reports. From the top down. The resolve for climate action has spread from the politicians in Paris to the people in Brisbane. Well, as the Paris climate talks have now come to an end, we're here to call on the federal and the state government to take strong leadership action on climate change. The Paris deal has gone further than many had expected. The document calls for nations to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. Each nation sets their own goals, which will be revisited every five years, and it sets aside 100 billion US dollars a year to help poorer nations cope with climate change. For the first time, all countries uh, will need to continually review and update their commitments over decades. The targets Australia took to Paris remain the same, to cut emissions by between 26 to 28 per cent by 2030. The harsh reality is Australia's current targets and policies would see warming of three to four degrees if others followed that suit. So Australia needs to revisit that. But significantly, it did agree to the broad goal to reach net zero emissions this century. So get rid of those fossil fuel subsidies, stop approving new coal mines. If Malcolm Turnbull genuinely wants Australia to be part of this agreement, then he must adopt tougher targets to reduce carbon pollution beyond 2020. He must commit to net zero emissions by 2050. Within Australia, there are plenty of demands to shoot higher on carbon cuts by 2030. And there's almost a consensus the nation will. The government oozes confidence its 26 to 28 per cent will be achieved. The opposition is looking at something like 45 per cent. Voters will get to pass judgment as early as next year. But before then, the Turnbull government's cast off one Abbott-era shackle on government investment in wind power. Under a new mandate, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation can invest in wind projects as long as they're focused on emerging and innovative technologies such as offshore wind technologies. The corporation's already committed $67 million to Australia's third largest wind farm at Ararat in Victoria. This is a common sense move and what it does is now allows the CEFC to invest in the whole range of innovative uh, creative solutions for all of the different renewable energy technologies. A change in the political winds welcomed by industry. Susan McDonald, ABC News, Canberra. The federal government's new mandate to once again invest in wind power is being met with cautious optimism by Victoria's wind industry. About 15 existing wind projects have been stalled and the state's only wind tower manufacturer has been forced to lay off workers. It's hoped the new decision will kickstart the industry. Sarah Farnsworth reports. Inside Portland's Keppel Prince factory, there is little sign of production. There would be um, probably 40 or 50 cans sitting in this, in this area ready to be welded together. Steve Garner says the anti-wind power rhetoric of Tony Abbott's government, together with the ban on wind energy investment, led to the industry stagnating. Absolutely stopped. Everything, everything ground to a halt. Over the past year, he's had to let go of 100 staff. The federal government's reversal of the ban on wind power investment is offering a small glimmer of hope. We're quite excited by what potentially uh, their government and the finance corporation will be able to do to help kickstart and get this industry up and running. The Victorian government has also welcomed the move. Now it'll be about seeing what they're prepared to do to reduce red tape that also has an effect on investment in wind farm energy here in Victoria. Under the new mandate, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation's focus will be on projects that involve emerging and offshore technologies. Offshore wind is still more expensive than other renewable technologies such as onshore wind and solar and we th therefore that's where the, the greatest opportunity uh, sits. 
Keppel Prince is starting work on the towers for the Ararat wind farm project. That's recently benefited from a $67 million investment from the government's Green Bank. That's the first can for the Ararat wind farm. We've, we've rolled that. So it's wind towers like this that will end up in Ararat. 35 from here, another 40 are being brought in from overseas. But that project was always going to go ahead. It wasn't reliant on Clean Energy Finance Corporation's help. But what's hoped now is that with this new mandate, there'll be a greater emphasis on local manufacturing and less need to import the towers. And retrenched workers are back on the job. Sarah Farnsworth, ABC News, Melbourne. While the Paris Agreement will likely be a boon for the renewables industry, it's another matter for Australia's key fossil fuel businesses like coal and gas. Finance correspondent Philip Lasker looks at the response from business. Altruism isn't a word that comes to mind when considering what motivates business. A more apt description would be profitability or pragmatism. Businesses across the board have been far more vocal about tax cuts than carbon emissions, whether they're adversely affected by climate change or not. But a global political agreement on climate change calls for pragmatism. The Australian Industry Group has given the deal its cautious approval. What we're hoping is that out of this deal in Paris, we will have some certainty going forward. We do have some flexibility for Australia in how we perform our part in meeting the targets. The fact that very little is set in concrete gives business plenty of room to negotiate. To achieve zero emissions by the end of the century, coal, oil and gas companies will have to find cleaner ways of operating if they want to survive. Former climate change advisor and leading economist Ross Garno says it won't be business as usual. That does require putting change on quite a different trajectory in Australia to what we've had in the past. But the coal industry says nothing has changed. It'll come down to the government's policy review in 2017 after the next election. That's when it'll have to unveil a tougher approach to emission targets and the coal industry. We need not panic. Uh, we do have to change more than had been contemplated, but uh, we've got time to do it. But Ross Garno doesn't see much disruption to financial markets in the short term. The time to see the writing on the wall was a few years ago. If you didn't adjust to the information that was available then, uh, then you've lost a lot of your money. Resources have already been knocked around, not by Paris, but by China. Philip Lasker, ABC News.